Hello, babies. It's Chapo Trap House coming at you post Labor Day, Tuesday, September 6th. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday and is gearing up for this fall autumn season. Before we get into the show, that's right, because you didn't pay for this episode, it's time for advertisements. What do we advertise on this show? That's right, the only thing we actually believe in ourselves. So, in case you haven't bought tickets, I'm going to give you the rundown. Our upcoming fall tour is but less than a month away, starting October 1st in Chicago, Illinois at the Vic Theater. Then we'll be in Los Angeles at the theater at the Ace Hotel on October 8th, then headed all the way across the country to New York City on October 14th. We'll be at the Town Hall Theater before ending up in Florida on October 30th. A Halloween show? Maybe. Will there be costumes? Come and see. Will there will there be um will there be ghouls spooks only in the audience folks yeah that is October thirtieth in Fort Lauderdale Florida at Revolution so oh yeah and then merchandise merchandise as well would you like to wear the T shirt of the podcast you're seeing live are you ready to be that cool it's the coolest thing you can do scientifically to be that level of money and pussy getting well then go to chapotraphouse dot shop to get those. Get those classic Chapo t-shirts that you could that you can explain to loved ones and relatives. And someone asks you, what's Project Paperclip? Why is it on your t-shirt? And you can you can yeah, start a conversation. We have one type of t-shirt that's like an embarrassing thing for a virgin to wear. Uh, because it has a podcast logo and name on it. But we have another type because it has Cold War minutia on it. And imagine yourself explaining that. And explaining regular just what a podcast is. All right. So, uh, friends, fans of the show, you already know what to do. Live show coming up less than a month away. New merchandise drops. It's only because you haven't paid for this show that you have to listen to this at the beginning of the show rather than at the end. But let's get into it for today. Gentlemen, how's it going? Not bad. Everyone's doing good. Everyone's feeling good. I know we took, uh, we took the Labor Day off because we work so damn hard. Uh, doing the show, but I guess let's just jump into it. Um, I suppose the uh, the big thing everyone was talking last week on the uh, sort of campaign politics front is uh, Joe Brandon. Um, the drug cocktail um, continues to uh, bear fruit. He gave sort of a sort of like the the most charged up campaign speech of uh, this election yet, and people are either loving it or hating it. And now. America must choose to move forward or to move backwards, to build a future or obsess about the past, to be a nation of hope and unity and optimism, or a nation of fear, division, and of darkness. MAGA Republicans have made their choice. They embrace anger. They thrive on chaos. They live not in the light of truth, but in the shadow of lies. But together... Together, we can choose a different path. Now, the people who love it uh, love it because Joe Biden is finally he's, he's he's taken dead aim at the MAGA Republicans that have taken over the Republican Party and the threat they pose to this country. He's we're singling them out, if you will, as he's a, calling as a, them out. A, he's calling them out. He's, he's taking names and he's calling out these this the semi fascist MAGA Republican ultra MAGA movement. Now, before you get too excited about this. I would just ask, I would ask you, Matt and Felix and our listeners, this simple questions. What if instead of calling out Republican politicians and Donald Trump, he was calling out Jews or black people? Would you feel good about it then? I would love to hear how that sounded. <laughs> Could you imagine Joe Biden performing the Holocaust? <laughs> I mean, they can. They imagine it every day, which is I guess they I, do. I guess they do. I, it's just it's amazing how. I, the, the the libs have have, have jujitsu Brandon around these guys to the point where now they have to take the dark Brandon bullshit seriously. Like they've actually bluffed them into that. It's amazing. It's how that just goes to speak how hair trigger and just addicted to anxiety and victimhood people are that they're just begging to they, they've invented Brandon. And the idea of Brandon is he's a, a fucking oaf. He's a he's a he's a sleepy perverted old uh fossil who doesn't know what he's doing and now you've turned him into what the democrats want him to be which is an epic powerful 
a laser eyed guy who can zap you into a cornfield if you piss him off. Yeah, it's um I would say it's akin to making like your very own inflatable uh like clown ornament for your front lawn or something, some type of uh, village festivity and then the getting violently molested by it. <laughs> sort of similar to what's going on with them. Uh yeah, it's like uh a dark Brandon it, it's gone from being like okay, dark Brandon has gone from being one of those sort of um uh, flailing blow up figures that are uh, often seen outside of car dealerships. He's gone from being one of those to one of those that um, abducts and kills your children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, what that's yeah. like, um, and of course, I mean, I guess it was like people made a lot of note of the sort of deep red and black background. Did this speech sort of look like, I don't know, uh, very sort of like, uh, you know, Adam Driver in the new Star Wars movies that it seemed like kind of the aesthetic they were going for. And, you know, like a uh, word on the grapevine is that White House staffers feel invigorated by Dark Brandon and Dark Brandon has become sort of their uh, their their mascot for this midterm election. And it seems to be working. <laughs> That's the funny part. I mean, you can't argue with polls are who. who Polls are polls. Who knows anymore? I, they, they've been basically systemically off for six years now. But the, the election results are, are pretty undeniable. It does seem like. And, and the thing is, does it have anything to do with Dark Brandon? Does it have anything to do with some dipshit uh, uh, meme jockey at the, in the White House comms department uh, scrolling Twitter and, and, and creating hashtags? No, it's that the fucking Republicans did what they always do, which is go too far with the Dobbs decision and it has clarified and re- uh, basically reversed the polarity of the typical uh, midterm trends. Uh, and that had nothing to do with anything anybody in the white house did, which is of course perfectly emblematic of a completely adrift powerless administration. I mean, it does see people like, I mean, people are, are, are like on both sides. I mean, they're like, they're, they're creaming themselves either out of um, contrived and obviously histrionic performative fear that um, the 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 dark branded militias will soon be rounding up God fearing, biblically oriented, constitutional style Americans, and you know, like I guess, just average Democrats who have a little bit of it. Like they're they're starting to feel it's starting to get a little bit of a chub because when they see like a Democratic politician like campaigning, like doing politics, like being like, hey, the other side, the people that you're not supposed to vote for, they're bad, and here's why. So Joe Biden gave the most threatening presidential speech in American history last week. He spoke in front of a blood red backdrop flanked by U.S. Marines. And he delivered, if you take a step back, the blueprint for the rest of his administration. Criminalize dissent, effectively ban the opposition and use the federal agencies to transform America into a one party state. But uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from the uh, New York Times. Four takeaways from Biden's speech in Philadelphia. It's by Jonathan Wiseman. Uh, He just writes, sure, Mr. Biden rattled off the accomplishments of his first year and a half in office, infrastructure, gun safety, prescription drug price controls, and the most important climate initiative ever. But in his address to the nation, Mr. Biden tacitly acknowledged that his predecessor still looms over the politics of the moment, like it or not. And he took it to Mr. Trump directly, calling him out by name and seeking to differentiate between the MAGA Republicans loyal to Mr. Trump and what he deemed reasonable Republicans who still stand by the American democratic experiment. There's no question that the Republican party today is dominated, driven and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans, he said. And it is, that is a threat to this country. Yeah. He's trying to make those people who voted, who split their ticket in 2020, basically, uh, and voted Republican at the state level, uh, that he's trying to keep them on board uh, with the Democrats and deepen their commitment to the Democrats below the top of the ticket by trying to uh, extend that association that existed during the presidential election when like Trump was literally on the ballot. It's the only call. They, it's the only move they have. And it's the same reason that they are propping up the campaigns of MAGA Republicans with actual money and advertising because it is their only move because getting those, keeping, uh, keeping those suburban uh, affluent whites uh, and having them become straight ticket Democrats is their only uh, uh, path forward because it's the only thing that can be squared with their actual policy uh, plans and, and uh, their incentives. 
Well, I mean, still, like, it, it's looking like mission accomplished, though, right? Because I, they have I mean, such a yeah. great dance partner. <laughs> they, yeah, no, I mean, they, um, they have everything, a dance partner. The, Repu- the Republicans are doing everything the Democrats are doing, but backwards and in high heels. <laughs> yeah, no, they um, they forgot the reason that they could only do abortion through, like, the least elected part of the entire government. Yeah. What I mean, I hate to say we were the first people to I was the first person to say it. That's they right, always folks. overread That's they folks. always overreach and piss people off. I said it in March. I said it in March. You get no you really get nothing for being right, but um me telling you this. Uh did I bet money on it? No, I didn't believe in it that much. But I was ready to say it. It is pretty astonishing to see these creeps backtrack on uh abortion. Cause like I like I don't know, like their consultants are just like the momentum they were feeling like led them to a situation just like a couple, like a month or two ago that like when asked the question, like uh, should a 10 year old rape victim um, be forced to uh, carry the term, the, ch- the child of her rapist, and then just look dead at the camera and say, yes. <laughs> and um, uh, once you do that, it's, it's sort of hard to crawl back from it. But of course, you know, You've noticed uh, Blake Masters and others scrubbing from their campaign website their everything they've ever actually said on abortion to some of them. The bizarre thing now that they do is that they'll say, oh, well, you know, obviously there needs to be some exceptions or they'll say, I think America's abortion policy should be in line with Western Europe's. And I was like, sorry, what? Like, so publicly funded abortions as part of a national health care program? Like, what are, what, are you, what are you talking about? Like this was this was murder a week ago, and now you're like, well, okay, like you know, the first trimester, please. There options need to be on the table. Yeah, no, I mean that is that's like the problem they've kind of always had with abortion is that no one wants a like maybe I don't know like twenty percent of the country at absolute most wants like a full ban, maybe ten percent or less wants prosecution of women who get abortions. But the only way to like be consistent with the it's murder line is to go for both those things. Otherwise, yeah. it collapses on itself. Yeah, that's the thing. They have to fully commit to the maximal thing because it's the only position with forward momentum. Other, it stagnates and then you lose the issue. You lose it as a motivating factor. That's why you have to sacrifice things like your short term interest in, say, winning the Senate in 2020 uh, for, to maintain the the stability of your of your uh, political coalition. And I guess like, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, but I mean, I think the open question is like um, through their control of um, state governments and especially the federal judiciary, like, will it matter that like the, the like the, the the electoral blowback for their overreach? Can they withstand it, essentially swallow it, but continue to criminalize abortion in places that otherwise don't want it? Like, I don't know if you guys I think we mentioned it briefly, but like. Uh, this 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 effort to get a referendum on abortion onto the ballot in the state of Michigan right now, they're pulling out all the stops to keep it off the ballot. Uh, something like seven hundred and sixty thousand signatures have been collected, um, and like they're attempting to disqualify it on a technicality. I'm not kidding regarding like uh, kerning and spacing on the official <laughs> officially re- like submitted application, because I mean like you know, and Michigan is a you know, has a very right wing state government, but like they know that like once this issue is taken away from the courts and, you know, sent back to the states, many, many of these states, if it is a yes or no question, it's very clear what side they're going to land down on, which is keeping abortion legal. And yeah, um, it's it's really hard to call because I think you're going to get some surprises like Kansas, but you are there are still states where like the most punitive anti-choice thing is very popular, namely Louisiana. I think Louisiana is the one where you can get the most punitive and most restrictive with the least amount of uh, blowback with like a democratic governor, you know, Democrats are incredibly, incredibly anti-choice there. But um, I do think, I don't know. They've got to be really panicking about this Alaska thing, right? Oh, right. Sarah Palin. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in a state as white as that, like that kind of, that's supposed to be your red wall, kind of places like that. If you're losing referendums by massive margins in Kansas and like, yeah, fucking losing that election in Alaska, then who do you have anymore? But the thing is, you need you still need the Democratic Party to effectively contain 
those desires. Like you have to have, you have it be a vessel for those opinions. And one of the big problems we have is that the democratic party is currently constructed cannot be that. I mean, we've, how many times have we seen some, some Republican Gorgon getting elected governor uh, on the same election day that a, uh, minimum raise hike passes with huge numbers or le- marijuana legalization or any other number, uh, any other number of popular broadly left liberal policies, but they cannot adhere those p- positions to the democratic party for cultural reasons. And that still persists even w- in a post Dobb world. That is true. I suppose like, uh, like, uh, and, and like, uh, as long as we're talking about the uh, federal judiciary and, uh, like how that plays all into this, have you guys followed, the uh, the latest development in the Trump classified documents case, which involves the appointment of something called a special master. Got to get that special master, <laughs> a special master by a Trump appointed federal judge who has interceded in this in this case. And like I was I was reading the uh, like the the New York Times article on this and the number of I, I had to laugh every time they just said like, you know, like it's a thing that we all it just we all agree upon now like oh this exists well well you know when the once the special master has reviewed the documents they will be the final arbiter on whether any crime was committed oh obviously it's just it's the special master we forgot about that clause it's just it, it, time and time again it's just you discover things like like a special masters or parliamentarians exist and we all have to take it seriously so wait the special master isn't a thing that the judge commands it's like a it's a person. guy Really? Yeah. Or, or a girl. Yeah. yeah. No, I've no, so. never heard of this before. Yeah, I've literally never heard of this before. Okay. Yeah, listen to this. A federal judge's extraordinary decision on Monday to interject in the criminal investigation into former, former President Donald J. Trump's hoarding of sensitive government documents at his Florida residence showed unusual solicitude to him, legal specialists said. This was an unprecedented intervention by a federal district judge into the middle of an ongoing federal criminal and national security investigation, said Stephen I. Vladek, a law professor at the University of Texas. Judge Cannon a Trump appointee who sits on the federal district court for the Southern District of Florida also blocked federal prosecutors from further examining the seized materials for the investigation until a special master had completed the review. In reaching that re- result, Judge Cannon took several steps that specialists said were vulnerable to being overturned if the government files on appeal. Uh, she granted the arbiter, I'm just jumping ahead here, it says, granted the arbiter known as a special master broad powers that extended beyond filtering materials were potentially subject to attorney-client privilege to also include executive privilege. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a special master. So, so, anyone so who that is a, a person yeah, who's been appointed. A person, like, it is a specific person who has been, so like all the, all, all the, like in, in, in this, like, I don't know, indictment or whatever, like, so like the, the, the federal prosecutor who brought, is bringing this case is now essentially, uh, barred from reviewing the supposedly classified materials until the special master, an arbiter appointed by this judge, can go over the materials first and decide what is classified and what's not, or what that special or, master. Or, yeah, yeah, that's right. The, Lev Parnas. It's Lev Parnas. <laughs> Lev Parnas. He's back, guys. You thought they canceled Parnas? He's not going away. Lev Parnas ain't going away, folks. He's the special master now. <laughs> I was going to say, as Judge Cannon was assigned to Mr. <laughs> After Judge Cannon was assigned to Mr. Trump's special master lawsuit, she made the unusual move of publicly declaring that she was inclined to instate one even before hearing arguments from the Justice Department. But she could have done so in a far more modest fashion. Judge Cannon has a reasonable path that she could have taken to appoint a special master to review documents for attorney client privilege and allow the criminal investigation to continue otherwise, said Ryan Goodman, a New York University law professor. Instead, she chose a radical path. A specialist in separation of powers, Peter M. Shane, who is a legal scholar in residence at NYU, said there was no basis for Judge Cannon to expand the special master's authority to screen materials that were also potentially subject to executive privilege. So, I mean, like, is this just something that's happening all the time that we're just not aware of? There's like, special I, masters running around the country. It's just, yeah, no, okay. Have you ever heard of someone who's like, oh, yeah, my husband is a special master? <laughs> no. Yeah. Unless, Maybe, it's probably not a job. It's, it's, it's not like a special prosecutor type deal where you take somebody, uh, some officer of the court, and you're like, hey, Steve, you want to be special master? He's like, fine. <laughs> There's not like a bunch of spe- special <laughs> masters at like a shape-up hall, like playing canasta. And drink a beer and waiting for the guy to come in and say, hey, 
We got the first four names on the list. Come get on the truck. We're going to be special masters. No, it's depressing I, if it's not like that. Uh, I think special masters should advertise their services on TV, like defense lawyers. Yeah. Do you need, do you need, do you need, do you your, need documents? Master? <laughs> <laughs> do you need documents subject to executive privilege, um, uh, screened for potentially classified information? That's right. Call me, special master. Your ass got mastered. <laughs> I guess well, this we're is seeing like, now the, the the bearing of fruit of the of the seating of the judiciary. This is all. It's why the machine. This is why our our, our democratic uh, organs are all their ble- white blood cells are going crazy. But the the infection is too powerful. It's it's gotten in too deep. Good luck. I am I I am kind of disappointed because it's like well we're never gonna like find the answer to the most interesting logistical question of all time. Like, what would it be like if Trump went to prison? It is kind yeah. of it. Like, I like thinking I, about we it. We talk about this. It be, is very interesting. A yeah. former president with Secret Service protection. How how would he be imprisoned? Okay. Because yeah. like, would that involve sending <laughs> sending Secret Service agents to prison with him? Yeah, like, so like I mean, you, you need like a dirty yeah. a dirty dozen of Secret Service agents. Dan, Dan Bongino. Dan Bongino. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's the a former who, Secret Service who, agent. Yeah, the guys who fucked the hookers in Colombia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just get them locked up with him and then like just get 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 them all in the same unit, the same cell. Or okay, like so that's one option. Get a bunch of patriotic secret service agents to commit crimes and get sent to the same prison as Trump and essentially continue to be his around the clock secret service protection. Or you outsource secret service protection to one of the mer- various many uh like ethnic mafias and gangs inside prisons. You know, the the A B, the M A. I think uh, AB black, would black be a strong fit. first round pick <laughs> a, there. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean the AB. I mean you're you're asking them first. You know, in prison, yeah. it's just there, there's certain rules that need to be followed. I, I mean, but the one thing going against that is like now conservatives talk about Latinos like the way that liberals used to talk about black women. <laughs> like it's exactly <laughs> the same now, where they're like Latinos been done telling y'all that they don't want their kids to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they no. That's like what they do. I'm not saying that they're saying it. Um, but um, you know, obviously, you would not put him in uh, Gen Pop, right? You'd have to put him in PC with the pedophiles, informants, and former cops. Um, but that would, I mean, how much different is that than like the, his entire life up to this point? That's like all of his friends now. <laughs> um, well, I mean, like you can imagine a situation, right? Where like, yeah, the the AB. That's the obvious pick for for Trump's Secret Service detail in prison. But I mean, this is government contracting we're talking about. What if they get a better bid from, from the black gangster disciples? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's a lot of options here. Uh, that yeah, then, and then Trump will you know he'll, he'll officially become part of the Black Gorilla family, and then he and, will finally, as he has long been foretold. Uh, convert to Nation of Islam. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Imagine if Trump converts to Islam in prison, folks. It's the, I mean, that, Dr. Yacoub, be- Dr. Yacoub, <laughs> very bad guy. Okay, he's on Patmos. That would he's be on Patmos. so. He went in there and he made he made the whites. He made white people, folks, and it was bad. It was not good. That would be especially fucked because he probably looks like out of anyone who's ever lived, looks the most like the first white people that they created. <laughs> he came out of the bog that yeah. that uh, Pat that uh, Doctor Jacob was like the first one out of the the cauldron. Yeah, he was like batch one. Yeah, batch one. Trump, uh, Trump, Trump has always he's always loved the Jews. The Jews have been great friends to Trump, but I never knew they're not the real Jews. Now, now that I'm embraced by the the original Israelites. Folks, I'm talking about the black Israelites. They're, they, they, some, some say they like Trump even more than the fake Jews. See, I think he would be like very well liked in prison. You know, like I, I think he has hustler mindset. I think he's kind of the guy who, you know, I think I think he would keep keep the peace between many of the warring prison gangs. I think he would help them do deals and negotiate things. I think he would be. I think I think he would like prison a lot. But I mean, he would have a great time. He would, he yeah. would a lot of people to talk to. You get into weightlifting? <laughs> no, uh, yeah, Na- Nation of Islam. Trump would be like, I, I would say, the main reason to send him to prison is to, uh, yeah. So just have realistically, him all they really want is to get him off the board. So if he gets convicted, I think, well, that's the thing. If he gets criminally, <laughs> he, here's the thing: if they did like put him on trial and then even convicted him, there would be nothing statutorily 
preventing him from still running for president from jail like on a platform of getting out of jail and pardoning (laughs) himself. That would be so much. If they impeached him and removed him from office, that'd be different because it says in the Constitution, if you get removed from office, you can't run for it again. But if you get convicted of a of a criminal penalty, I don't think there's anything. Nothing in the rules says that a dog can't run for president from prison. I would love it if he was using his phone time to like call into a debate. <laughs> <laughs> He's from behind the bulletproof glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just you'd be like, uh, I'll a- I'll answer your very very. I'll, I would answer your very unfair, very biased question, but uh, I, I I'm <laughs> the gentleman behind me looks very eager to get on the phone. Trump out. <laughs> By the way, I just if it, I'm leaving, a, I'm just going to leave a number here if anyone wants to call. I need ramen noodles. That's what people <laughs> want here. I need lots of ramen noodles. Put it on my books. <laughs> he would never be able to make any of those ramen meal delicacies. No, no. He would man. absolutely burn down the fucking place even attempting such a thing. Uh, no, I mean, like, look, I mean. He would probably go to some cushy prison. He'd have he'd have fucking PlayStation. No, he would get house arrest if he got any. Yeah, he'd be. They, getting, they would put, not send him to a, a facility. They would just like put an ankle monitor thing around his 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 uh, elbow, his ankle, and have him stay at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> but like that would be like uh, that would be like the one time uh, like when I was in grade school that I got the very the very serious punishment, sort of like you know like a, a level or two down from expulsion of one day of outhouse suspension which means I didn't have to go to school for a day. I thought it meant they kept you in an outhouse. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, that would have been a punishment. They just kept me in a porta potty all day long. <laughs> that would have been a pun- that's, that's a step higher than detention. But I remember my parents were like, okay, uh, we're going to work, but like, don't watch TV or like have fun. Like just, you know, d- just be bored. You know, like this is punishment. And I was like, yes, mother. Yes, father. I mean, can you imagine if Trump's like his criminal punishment was like you have to you have to be on a golf course twenty four seven. You can never leave, and all your friends are there, all the dentists, all the boat dealers, all the cosmetic surgeons in Florida. That like that's your gang. That's your prison gang. You get to yeah. trade cigarettes with them and fucking yeah. He's like already on house arrest. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's much. like his lifestyle already. Yeah, pretty much. I just uh, I have one more funny detail here from uh, about Trump. This is just courtesy of New York Magazine. There's all these books coming out about Trump, and uh, this new one is about, uh, you know, conveniently enough about Trump and his longtime relationships with lawyers. In that, like, he has a, sp- a particular penchant for never paying his attorneys. Yeah, he uh, never just, does. He will no, give them. Uh, sometimes he'll be like, uh, "I've got uh, Roy Jones Jr.'s jockstrap here. <laughs> Want that? Okay. Well, okay, we're, we're, we're taking trade or barter." <laughs> Listen to this story. This is uh, the Guardian, which obtained. Uh, this is uh, New York Magazine's writing about this new book. It says the Guardian, which obtained an advanced copy, says Enric reports back in the 1990s, a lawyer at a white shoot law firm who worked for, for who worked for Trump confronted the mogul about a two million dollar bill he refused to pay. Uh, reading from the book here, it says after a while, the lawyer lost patience. And he showed up unannounced at Trump Tower. Someone sent him up to Trump's office. Trump was initially pleased to see him. He didn't betray any sense of sheepishness, but the lawyer was steaming. I'm incredibly disappointed, he scolded Trump. There's no reason you haven't paid us. Trump made some apologetic noises. Then he said, I'm not going to pay your bill. I'm going to give you something more valuable. What on earth is he talking about, the lawyer wondered. I have a stallion, Trump continued. It's worth $5 million. Trump rummaged around in a filing cabinet and pulled out what he said was a deed to a horse. He handed it to the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> He's named Black Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for the deed to my horse. <laughs> oh, my God. I, yeah, it's like, no, I love it. It's like I, he only hires like Atticus Finch type attorneys who like can take things and barter but you know also he hires Atticus Finch type attorneys because he's often accused of sexual assault <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah that's what's going on uh, here in America uh, I guess just uh, a little overseas now some 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 bad news from uh, overseas did you guys see that um, Chile's referendum to have a new constitution uh, was tanked resoundingly at the polls yeah, not, uh, not not great not great uh it would have undone the uh the constitution written by the chicago boys under the reign of general pinochet which you know basically just like 
it, it, it like it's like a country with a constitution that like makes it so it's like illegal to raise taxes or not sell your lithium to American and British companies. Yeah. Uh, and you know this is this was like a centerpiece of uh, Boric's like you know his his new administration and sort of like the hopes for a, a a new Chile that would like you know finally get past the you know dictatorship that this country imposed on it. Um, this you know like the the constitution would have guaranteed universal health care, gay rights, abortion, like like a lot a lot of good things. But uh, yeah, and it was like you know I. I I've read some, you know, like a lot of some, some analysis of it that it wasn't like the people wanted to so it wasn't really a referendum. Like, do we want to keep the Pinochet era constitution? It was just sort of like, oh, we don't want this constitution. But the best analysis of like one way or the other of something like this that I, that I saw was from uh, Vincent Bevins, who said that like in the democratic world just recently, like anytime you give voters, like if you put, if you pose something to voters as like, do you want what you currently have now or something better? Do you want to go for what's in the box? It just, it never works. Depending, nobody wants. No, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Right. No one wants to go what's in the box. No yeah, one wants to know what's empty. in the box. Get out of there. There's no there's no legitimacy or implicit trust because uh, it hasn't been built. It got it was either never built in the first place or more often the case ripped out and destroyed, which is certainly the case in Chile. Well, I mean, yeah, disheartening. It's uh, you know, it's hard to see where uh, what what. Boric does from here. I mean, did they just go back to the drawing board and they're like, okay, try? How about this constitution? I do think that. Yeah, I think that they they're they're going to start over again. So that's good. Okay, they should they should just use the uh, Golden Corral Customer Bill of Rights. Just good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Free refills. <laughs> or the thing that they have in front of every Cracker Barrel now. That's like we're yeah. not racist anymore. <laughs> 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 we were uh, th- th- this this plaque here certainly was not court ordered <laughs> uh yeah so uh that's a setback but hey let's, let's let's just jump across the atlantic here's some good news just a tip of the cat a tip of the cap and just a wide a, a wry cheeky wink and sort of raise of the pint glass the new british prime minister liz trust liz trust folks we've got dude i i trust in trust and we're all we're all gonna get we're getting trussed up by liz we're getting and whatever we're the getting, fuck she's she's, gonna, she's grabbing us whoever by the, the fuck she is yeah i have no <laughs> idea who this <laughs> who person the is. Fuck is this An absolute becoming last <laughs> in my opinion is she a top bird? Is she a goer? Oh my god! Yeah, say- this is a ma- this is just like a masterwork of a bird. Hold on, I'm looking up who the fuck this woman is, uh, so I can thank her parents who are uh, just Jesus Christ. What a long article. I mean, I guess she's <laughs> prime minister, but like, who cares? Um, jo- Professor John Kenneth Trust and Priscilla Trust, uh, formerly known as Priscilla Grasby. Yeah, good work on creating such a fire daughter. She is. I've never heard of this fucking woman before ever in my life. I want Boris. <laughs> no back. fucking. I don't. I don't even know how to make fun of her. Um, I mean, I'm sure she's awful, but I mean, I, look. Let's just stick to what we know, boys. Here, I know we've gotten a little far afield of our of our knowledge, and I don't. I don't want to say anything that's untrue. So let's just you know rely on what we do know, which is back Boris. Bring back Boris. Boris Brexit. Boris, come back now. We want you. Yeah, I'm very sick of you fucking English motherfuckers trying to make us remember more guys and gals. This is yeah. ridiculous. There's been too it's too many. I don't know so about you, you. Get back to Boris. I don't know about you guys, but the moment that Boris like actually got on the plane to like to go like give his foreskin to the queen or like whatever <laughs> they do when they step down as PM, it felt like that was an awful feeling. Because it's like, okay, it's done. Like the toothpaste is out of the tube. He can't be saved because every day that it seemed like Boris was going to step down, they're like, oh, uh, conservative MPs might rebel and might like demand that we keep Boris. And I thought the fun would keep going. But no, it sucks. We have Liz Trust. Uh, well, there is apparently a group. There is a small caucus of Tory PMs who are trying to get a no confidence vote going so that they can bring back Boris. It's well, there. It's still alive. So Boris can come back if we believe in him. Well, you know, if you know any of those Tory MPs who are looking for, you know, uh, a, a fairly sizable American podcast platform to be interviewed on or help get their message out, send them our way. We back Absolutely. Boris. We, we raise a pint to Boris. Every, before we start recording, I mean, honestly, I wish we could share it with you. We all, we all raise a pint of, a pint of ale, a pint of bitters, some lager. 
to the number one lad, Boris Johnson. We want a cheeky pie, isn't it? He's just a, uh, yeah, no, we just believe in him. We always have. Always will. And uh, I just, uh, I, you know, I was kidding for, I do not, I do not trust trust. Don't, uh-uh. don't like, I do not trust like Trust is bird. sus. Yeah, trust yes. is sus. Let's get that hashtag going. So yeah, who is Liz Trust? All I know about her is, is this the clip? In December, I'll be in Beijing opening up new pork markets. New pork markets. <laughs> <laughs> That's her. That yeah. is the Charisma Dynamo about to take over the UK. Good luck, lady. When, when they're fighting uh, in the streets for fuel in the, in the winter. Yeah. They're, no, when they're burning is, down Big Ben just so they, they can get some warmth. That is the prime minister like before the Hitler guy in V for Vendetta. <laughs> 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 it's like who immediately comes before oh, god I damn she makes it she makes fucking she makes Theresa may just look like james brown in 1971 <laughs> yes <laughs> she had dynamo she had to dance at least i feel good yeah no 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 oh yeah oh god oh god the Theresa may dance oh just like the jerky halting motion of her body just oh good god Ugh. Her arms like two highlight baskets. <laughs> <laughs> Giant scoop arms. She was amazing. Pork markets. She's opening new pork markets. Well, I mean, actually, someone should someone should be asking her about that. She was just she was over in China fucking around with uh with 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 hog markets, mm, wet markets. Very good question. What's you know, uh, was was this was this a Wuhan pork market? Liz Truss, I think some questions need to be answered. I'll be opening new pangolin markets next month. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the new chips in England will just be um, pangolin shards, you know, like they're sort of scales. Just those, are probably, those are probably good for your bones. They probably have a lot of calcium in them. I'm having a pangolin butty, mate. <laughs> just like a couple, st- a couple stacks of those scales on, on a piece of bread and some butty. Oh, uh, yeah. Good luck, England. Yeah, you're gonna need it. Oh my god. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And they're all honestly, they're all salivating over the prospect. They you love know, it. They love it. They live in the blitz. They love it. They, I can't wait till they're living in the underground stations for warmth or whatever. And it's just like this is the height of being British. This is what being British is all about. Uh, did you see that crazy uh, that crazy old bat on British TV telling people to like put aluminum foil behind their radiator to like double the heat? There we go. And she was like, don't put your couch against the radiator. You want to heat the house, not the couch. What if I'm sitting is- on the couch, though? Then I'm yeah. warm because I'm basically on like a warmed couch. Well, Concentrates I mean, the there heat. More efficient. Uh, there, are, there are many, many thrifty ways that you can heat a can of beans. But yeah, welfare scroungers out there, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to get the spirit of Dunkirk in you because it's going to be fucking cold this winter. Yeah. And by cold, I mean, I don't know, what, 50 degrees? What's the coldest it gets over there? <laughs> They're going to be dying. Yeah, one way or another, some some frozen lima beans there. Oh, uh, it's going to be good. I guess um, I guess this goes back to, uh, to Trump, but we go from England to France. Uh, did you see Trump bragged he had intelligence on Macron's sex life? Ooh. Yeah. What could it be? I mean, I feel like, don't we all have that same intelligence on Macron's sex <laughs> yeah. life? Yeah. That he married a... He married his fucking English teacher or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he likes some, he likes some mature, he likes yeah. some sort of, you know. Yeah. I, it is very funny refined. that Trump apparently thought that like it was key to get some sort of sexual blackmail on a French president. <laughs> he did not understand the assignment, but maybe it's just that the end of the, maybe it's just that the guy, he loves gossip. It's like, oh, I got the CIA at my disposal. Tell me who's tell me who's having sex with who. And then I'll be like, uh, I'll get people in there. I'll be like, you'll never guess who Macron is seeing. I mean, like, I mean, if it were to be like compromat, it would be like, I have intelligence that Macron has literally only fucked his wife during the tenure of their marriage. Yeah, that would be very, that would yeah, like, bring down the government. Like he doesn't believe, he's, he's had many opportunities to take a mistress and he's, um, you know, declined them all because of his love and loyalty to his former history teacher. No, uh-uh, sicko shit, yeah. get out of here. Uh, just, just from Rolling Stone, I'm just reading here, it says, 
It's not clear whether the Macron-related document the FBI sees during the raid had anything at all to do with the French president's personal life, nor is it clear whether the information on Macron sees from Mar-a-Lago is derived from U.S. intelligence collection or even classified. But the mere revelation of his existence triggered a transatlantic freakout, according to two other sources familiar with the situation. And Trump's prior talk about Macron's allegedly naughty ways that not very many people know only intensified those concerns. Both French and U.S. officials worked to figure out precisely what Trump had on Macron and France's government. And if any of it was sensitive in nature, the sources said. The officials in both nations wanted to know if this discovery signified some kind of national, national security breach or if it amounted to a frivolous but stolen keepsake. <laughs> a stolen keepsake from Macron. He's just like, he's just pilfering pens and fucking <laughs> and stationery. He's got the Pink from- Panther, folks. I got it. <laughs> I mean, well, I only, a, only a clumsy inspector could possibly get it back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I have to say that, like, by virtue of him just saying, like, oh, he's been naughty, that it's if it isn't the same thing that we all know, obviously, it's like he had an affair. He had a normal affair, which, like, they all do, you know, like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's this is this is. uh <laughs> Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to imagine what kind of um, uh, chicanery and hijinks a French politician could get up to that would be uh, a national security breach or something that would bring down their government. So, Macron, no matter what, whatever naughty hijinks you've gotten up to, I think you can sleep soundly tonight, knowing that it's probably not going anywhere. Or what? Well, actually, we don't know. The special master is on the case, so we'll see what the special uh, he's master. He's a wild comes card. With. Yeah, the spe- <laughs> you always got to remember the folks. There's a special master out there. Yeah. And they could upend the board at any time. Uh, okay, here's another story from uh, international news. This was well, this will be of note to um, our Catholic listeners. You should be of interest in this. Pope dissolves Knights of Malta leadership, issues new constitution. Holy shit. This this is this is this is uh, for your history heads out there. He's he's calling back to he's, he's going old school now. Dissolving the Knights of Malta. Yep, that's right, folks. Guelphs are in control, okay? <laughs> the Pope's party is riding high. We're going to see all of the all of the traitors, all, all the snakes, they're all coming out when the when uh, the Pope here cuts the grass. I don't know too much about like Catholic lore or hierarchy or like what you want your build to be to be a long lasting pope or like what alliances you need to make. But someone said that um it's like he's trying to avoid a coup. That person seems to know a lot more about the Vatican than I do, so I'll take their word for it. Uh, Just reading here from Reuters, Pope Francis on Saturday dissolved the leadership of the Knights of Malta, the global Catholic religious order and humanitarian group, and installed a provisional government ahead of the election of a new Grand Master. The change, which the Pope issued in a decree, came after five years of often acrimonious debate within the order and between some top members of the old guard and the Vatican over a new constitution some feared would weaken its sovereignty. Uh, He also did some moves of uh, sort of kneecapping uh, a lot of the uh, sort of authority of Opus Dei as well. So, yeah, it seems like he is trying to head off at the pass. You know, uh, some of the more some of the more restive elements in his uh, in his coalition in the Vatican. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how the election goes. So, I mean, he's got to keep the moderates in line. But you know, he could. We could. We could be seeing a new pope sometime soon, depending on how the votes shake out. I I hope that the new pope uh, is perhaps I don't know maybe a break from tradition in some way around race or uh, uh, age perhaps maybe a maybe instead of another old pope maybe maybe hear me out a young pope remember that guy. <laughs> What about what about teen pope? A teen pope? It's not uh, it's not illegal. The, the best part about the pope is that it's not, they don't even technically have to be a uh, a clergyman. So it's sort of like Supreme Court justices. Yeah, you, know, you can like, make yeah. Mel Gibson the pope if you want. Ooh, Ooh now we're talking. Let's shirts. go. <laughs> there's an amazing choice. <laughs> if, if if the Francine faction in the current civil war of the, of the within the Vatican loses, they absolutely the 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 ultra maintain guys should absolutely put the Mel Gibson in there just as an absolute show of show of their position. Yeah. But then, I mean, like then he'll stop acting and direct, or maybe he can keep acting and directing and movies. Yes. But just as Pope. Uh, yes. Can you imagine like, he's, he's, he's behind the camera and he's got the hat on. Yeah, no, but like, he'll have to, like he'll be in character, but he can't get out of costume. <laughs> 
Right. You know, so it's just like Lethal Weapon Five. It's him and Danny Glover doing spoofs and goofs, but he's got you know the, the miter. He's got a, he's, he's got, got a the tiara. Yeah, he's got all the the silken robes on or whatever, and it's just you know, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> All right, I guess I guess return to America for a second. Uh, we're just, you know r- running through these stories here. Uh, the other really funny thing going on right now in, in terms of uh, the election is a uh, god of fraud, uh, Rick Scott, has somehow been appointed, been put in charge of all of the money for the Republican National Senate Committee, and he spent all of it. Uh, it's this pretty is wild. Year- uh, it says, um, basically, one fundraising scheme used by the Senate committee, which has not previously been disclosed, involves sending an estimated millions of text messages that ask provocative questions. Should Biden resign? Followed by a request for cash. Reply yes to donate. Those who replied yes had their, donat- donat- <laughs> their donation processed immediately, though the text did not reveal in advance where the money was going. Privately, some Republicans complained the tactic was exploitative. WinRed, the party's main donation processing platform, recently stepped in and took the unusual step of blocking the committee from engaging in the practice, according to four people familiar with the matter. So, I mean, like Rick Scott has raised like a record amount of money. Uh, basically, he's, he's raised something like $180 million uh, by the end of July this year, but has already spent 95% of it, which is... Certainly, it's it's a cause for a few eyebrows to be um, cocked in an upward position, shall we say? But I mean, he's he's the god of fraud. He's he's the king of stealing money. It is it is ins- it's wild that they were like, hey, we need one of our Senate uh, brethren to be in charge of raising and distributing funds. How about the guy whose entire claim to fame is just doing unprecedented world historical Medicare fraud? Like you. That was his one trick. You put him in charge. It's all he knows how to do. There's no other value add with fuck, what other than him looking like a freshly born uh, xenom- xenomorph. There is no benefit to him other than his scam uh, history, his brilliant knowledge of how to rip things off, which is you, you idiots. I mean, usually like when you when you raise that big of a war chest, you're, you're hoping to spend it like, you know, leading up to the election. <laughs> You yeah. know, I mean, not not as soon as you raise it, it's already out the door to Christ knows where. And I do like the bit about like, you know, because we all, we all get the text like, you know, uh, pr- you know, reply no to stop these texts or whatever. But like, <laughs> you, you know, you have selected no, meaning no, you would li- you would not like us to stop sending you these texts and also charging your checking account every time you reply. But I mean, come on, like. This is a brilliant fundraising strategy for raising money from the fucking uh, the the old people that make up most of the people who donate to campaigns, right? And yeah. especially Republican old people, they love they love getting fleeced over the phone and the internet. They do love getting scammed. It's their favorite thing. They love clicking a link that says after their password says has been taken or something like that. Click this link to win a new iPhone or something like that. You know, uh, uh, respond with your social security number to support Rick Scott and Senate Republicans. They love it. It's their favorite thing in the world. I saw one email, one fundraising email that said, you are the only Republican in your area who has not been briefed on this secret email. Uh, why, why are you betraying Trump like this? Download this email and then delete it immediately. <laughs> like they're going to get, they, they're going to be put on like the prescription lists if they don't. Uh, get this intelligence briefing. That was like uh, when um, uh, fucking uh, Wool, when we went to the Wool Berkman press conference at the uh, Gaylord Convention Center at CPAC. Oh yeah, and they handed out um, they <laughs> they handed out the, their dossiers on Ilan Omar's illegitimate marriage to her brother, and they they just said top secret classified on the cover sheet, <laughs> and they were like. Yeah, we're clearing you. To, we're clearing you to read these documents now. And I was like, I just want to be clear. Like, I, I have been uh, assigned a Q level clearance to read these documents. I don't want to go to jail. I don't we want. I don't all, want to have to reply on the special master. Yeah, we could have all, all. We could have needed one. Like, we could have. It could have been three years ago. We found out what a special master is before anyone. <laughs> yeah, because we were. Yeah, we were not cleared to read those documents, but thankfully we were. So I'm. I'm. You know. I'm. I'm not worried about that. So yeah, uh, just the, an, an astonishing. I mean, Rick Scott, what a god! He's the man, but he knows his business, and that is uh, scamming the elderly. Yep, and it's I guess his like life's I mean, work. It's it's his it's his true love, taking money I mean, from old people, uh, and then using it to uh, put unguents on his disgusting bald head. 
<laughs> I mean, like he's obviously brilliant at stealing money from old people, but like I think and Mitch the McConnell and the and the government, yeah. But I guess from if you're Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party, the question is like, what, what are you doing with all of the this money the that you've stolen? Choice. That you've stolen. It seems like it seems like McConnell. Maybe I don't know. Maybe when did he point him? Because it's, it has to have been a while now. I maybe he is. I mean, he's probably a good fundraiser himself. Is what it is. is they yeah. probably pick guys who have a good track record and good networks, and then but they put them in charge of a whole thing, including all of these digital uh, elements, and they could just go hog wild. They could just they you can get real creative, and they have. I guess like the uh, the the last news story from this week that I want to talk about that is like I guess like outside the realm of campaigning. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys uh, have followed this whole thing with um, Kiwi Farms and the Twitch streamer Keffels. Like, I was only, I was basically made aware of what Kiwi Farms is this week. I had been on Keffels' stream for like 20 minutes. I went on her show to do like a like a fundraiser. But like, like Felix, like I, I don't like. I know you saw this story. Like, like yeah. what is your take on this whole thing? Because from what I can tell, Kiwi Farms was a fucking sewer. And they blight, and it's, she's done. Every, Kevin has done everyone a favor, fucking uh, just sending that down the fucking toilet. Yeah, you know, I'm like usually against like any t- like knocking any type of site off. I do think it crosses the line when it's like the point is just like getting people to kill themselves, right? Like the point is being like, oh, here's this person's like address and phone number. When that's like the main focus, I think that's different than any like speech concern, you know. I have to say, I was very surprised that it happened. I was not. I was not betting on Keffel's winning here. That was not. That was not my guess. It was not my first guess that would happen. I was very surprised. I mean, holy shit! And like, what, like, what can is, you say? And like, this is a forum that like was basically started around people. Um, I don't know, like pouring over every detail of Chris Chan's life. Yeah, and I mean, like, okay, so the argument for this website existing is like, okay, look at like how many people that we have, uh, we've cataloged all, all the information on. Look at the ones that are pedophiles. Look at the ones that are rapists. Look at the, look at Christian, you know, Christian ra- raped her mom. Okay. Well, Christian is probably the most documented doxed, uh, ordered pizzas to person ever in the history of humanity. Right. Did that work? Do you, you know what you I mean? That- how well did that fucking work? Did you think that, yeah, you think that made them a better or worse person, like, despite how, like, you know, I don't know, maybe mentally unwell or, I don't know, malevolent their personality was to begin with? But, yeah, like, what, like, it just seems like the, the whole purpose of this site was, like, an even more, um, like, uh, just sort of, like, an even seedier and, like, less well-known but f- way more widespread libs of TikTok. Yeah. And it no, was just, yeah. yeah, like, and, like, you know, like, and, like, sw- and, like, actually swatting people, like, like sending a fucking SWAT team to their house shit like yeah. that yeah I mean like there's a similar thing that everyone does online now right it's that you're the reason that you're like laughing at someone or like archiving every bit of information on them is because you think they're a freakish person but the, there's always a justification if you're lefty it's that like oh they're fucking racist or they're they're a not all men guy um, and that's it's rarer in those instances that you'll swat someone though. It has happened in this case, you know, it's like, like, okay. in the few instances that like they did catalog like pedophiles or something, that's not the reason you were like looking after them, you know? Yeah, exactly. It was like, yeah, like, no, you're, you're, you're looking for someone who like can fit the like pre-made excuse in your head to do the thing that you already wanted to do to, to them and other people, which is like, yeah, make their life hell, um, get them to kill themselves, fucking, and then like, and then revel in it with other people. It just seemed like a fucking, just like a giant like water wheel of like human misery and cruelty. That um, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 hard for me to imagine like you know, like f- you know, free speech or like you know, the open internet or whatever. It's just like, is humanity like better or worse off with with or without this thing existing? And it's very hard for me to come down. <laughs> on the ladder that like uh you know like you can concoct some argument that like oh like actually like as or just like to like to, to, to feel up in arms or like take any kind of contrarian position on something like this just being thrown in the trash and just getting rid of it yeah no i really don't see any reason to keep it around uh and then like also like this is in light of the bomb i mean like this happened like 
a week after like someone called in a bomb threat to the Boston Children's Hospital because of libs of TikTok and like Matt Walsh and shit like that just over yeah like because you know like they as, as part of their it's a children's hospital and they provide I, I would assume like some some level of uh you know a, a trans care or you know help transitioning for for kids and you know like if, if you're there to protect children from groomers or whatever again it's like that's just like because you know like children you know once you have that in your mind it like justifies like basically doing anything if you think that like someone's imperiling children but when you're calling in a bomb threat to the like one of the country's biggest and best children's hospitals even if it's a fake bomb threat it's just like what do you like what do you think you're doing here like are you protecting kids i mean because like again in their mind i think they would say yes and i thought matt walsh or whatever was like oh like psh, you know, uh, I, I'm owed an apology or something because it wasn't a real bomb. And when everyone said that someone called in a bomb threat, that was like fake because, or, or like they, it, it, it's it. The stories need to be corrected because there was no bomb. It was just someone made a bomb threat. Whereas like the headline is bomb threat called in. It doesn't necessarily imply that there is a bomb. It's just it's just something that demands that you have to investigate it and like evacuate a you know a hospital full of patients to do. Um. So yeah. Uh, pretty gross. Um, and I guess uh, just uh, shout outs to Keffels. Like I uh, was I was basically unaware of uh, what Kiwi Farms was or how much they'd made her life a living hell. But um, yeah, just shout outs to her. Hope she uh, stays safe. Um, I guess before we before we finally end the show today, uh, I'd like to just uh, pause to give a in memoriam to former Chapo guest Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, just a proper RIP and respect from all of us here at the Chapo family. Um, hugely influential writer. Uh, was honored that she came on the show. But I mean this with all respect. Uh, uh, will be remembered at least fondly and dearly to my heart for inspiring my favorite tweet of all time. <laughs> yes, she will yeah. finally now be able to reckon with the multiplicity of her offenses. <laughs> and the intersectional you know, like, nature of them also. <laughs> yeah. um, Barbara, wherever you are. You did a racism. You did an imperialism. You did no growth. And you know what? That's the funniest part about that tweet is that the actual tweet says you did no growth. But as long as I as long as I've ever been aware of it, as long as the number of times you've said it on this show, for me, it will always be you did a no growth. And I think, I think that's yeah, just, that's a death of the just, author thing. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's it's such a better phrase. It works so much better. It's a concept that has unlimited utility. Yeah, you did no growth is just like awkward grammatically. Yeah, no, that is no growth. It's like an an introduction, a new introduction to the language, a new thing, the concept of a no growth. And you know, when we had Barbara on, it was to talk basically about uh, death and um, like her um, basically acceptance of death. So, I mean, I think she was uh, very admirable in that regard. But you know, Barbara, wherever you are. In your honor, we will continue to do many, many no growths. I will continue to just not Two, grow. Three, many no growths. <laughs> yes. Never going to grow. Let, That's let the promise. A, let a thousand no growths bloom is my message to you all. Let them no grow. They yeah. stay the same. They don't bloom. They don't, they don't do anything. They don't grow. So they stay where they are. A thousand of them. And then just uh, one more time from uh, myself and the entire Chapo family. Rest in peace to Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, sending our best wishes to your friends and family. What a life. uh, What a legacy she leaves. So, till next time, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye.